All right, it's 201. How many people we got? 60. Let's get going. So today, um, we're going to look at second law of thermodynamics. Um, can you guys see this? See my slides? Okay. So there's this physicist called C.P. Snow. He was around back in the 60s. He was a thermodynamicist. And uh, he has poor social skills like most physicists do. And he, he said the following with respect to the second law of thermo. He said, a good many times I've been present at gatherings of people who, by the standards of the traditional culture, are thought highly educated and who have with considerable gusto been expressing their incredulity, can't ever say that word, of scientists. Once or twice I've been provoked and have asked the company how many of them could describe the second law of thermodynamics. The response was cold, it was also negative, yet I was asking something which is the scientific equivalent of have you read a work of Shakespeare? So um, what he meant to say is, is this is something every, everybody should know um, if you're you know, in the Western half of the world. I think everybody should know it the world over I only mentioned the Western half of the world because Shakespeare doesn't need to necessarily be, be known no matter where you are. But I think I would argue that this is even more important than reading a work of Shakespeare. It's something everybody knows intuitively and heuristically. You see it all around you. Um, it's just formalized in thermodynamics and called the second law of thermo. The first law, again, is Energy is what it is. It can neither be created nor destroyed. Um, you can't make energy. You can't make energy disappear. Uh, the amount of energy in a system can be measured and added up. And the second law states that the quality of energy degrades over time. It says that energy tends to disperse in, in all directions and become less useful over time. So let's look at that data those ideas a little bit here. Okay, so again, quick review, thinking about entropy ball and energy ball. Uh, energy ball was the bouncy ball that would bounce and then return to my hand. It doesn't get quite up to the level of where I dropped it. A teeny bit of energy was lost. The bouncy ball was very elastic, but um, some of that energy was lost to sound to vibrations in the floor, uh, air resistance. And so that caused molecules in the floor, the ball, and the air to slowly heat up just a teeny bit. And so all of that potential energy that turned into kinetic energy didn't return quite as potential energy. A teeny bit was lost. But for the sake of thinking about the first law, most all that energy came back. Um, the entropy ball, the ball of clay, all of its potential energy was dispersed, was lost to the environment. It turned into waste heat, mainly in clay, clay minerals rubbing against each other, and then a little bit in the floor and air resistance and, and sound and things like that. So where did the energy go? It spread out everywhere throughout, the, throughout my room and eventually into the universe. Uh, and no matter how much I heat entropy ball up, no matter how much energy I put into it, I can't put the kind of energy that would bring it back up unless I physically, you know, lift it up into the air. And so that says, tells us something. It tells us that the quality of energy varies, that different types of energy are more useful or not. So today we'll think about how energy disperses in the absence of constraints and what that might mean. Okay, normally we'd be in a classroom and I have this cute exercise developed by a former professor of mine, Chris Edwards, and uh, we would have nine students sit with balloons in one section of the room. And then I would, with certain rules, I would allow the balloons to spread out and we'd measure the energy density. And I put quotes there because we'd measure how many balloons were in a certain group of people. We measure how much energy there was in a certain location. And through not much action of no, no real rules of my own, we would see the balloon slowly spread across the room. And then furthermore, after the game was over, 
we just let the balloons do whatever they want and we can see them slowly spread across the entire room, across the lecture hall, et cetera. Um, I'm trying to think if there's some other example of that I could do. Hold on, I'll be right back. Let's try not to light my house on fire. So here's a match, right? The energy, I'll use this camera. Let's see if this camera works today. Stop share. Zoom controls, where'd you go? Video, this camera, yes, it works today. Get it in focus. Okay, here's a match, simple wooden match. This has chemical energy, mainly uh, sulfur and phosphorus. Um, when it's heated up, it has a low activation energy and it'll combine with oxygen in the atmosphere. And that chemical bond, that chemical formation will put those two uh, atoms in a lower chemical energy state as they form that molecule. And that releases energy in the way of heat and light. And so this is very ordered right now. It's, it's reduced atoms that are sitting here in this match and they're all in a small amount of space. And this wood is carbon, it's lignin molecules, all nicely chained up grown in a tree somewhere. And so it's all ordered. It's staying in you know one place. It's not spreading out. It's not dispersing at all. But as soon as I light it, now there's smoke being produced and the molecules of this match, the carbon, the phosphorus, and the sulfur are all spreading across this room as heat and light. And if I put it out, we can see it's smoking, sort of. Maybe I can go like that or something. So whatever was in that match has now spread across the entire room. I can smell it. I can feel a teeny bit of heat on my hand and there's no way for me to put that back. I can't take that sulfur and phosphorus and carbon and put it back in that state. The only way I can do that is go mine some new sulfur and grow a new tree. I can't magic that back together. And so entropy has something to do with the arrow of time. You can see, that's why when you play a video in reverse, it looks so bizarre because you're seeing um, entropy in reverse. You're seeing uh, things that tend to disperse all of, all of nature um, coming back together and it doesn't make sense. Uh, so why, why do things do that? It's, it's not like a fundamental property of the universe that things tend to spread out. What's happening is that the universe is governed by a few rules and the statistical likelihood of things spreading out in any random direction, it's much more likely than things coalescing and coming back together. Okay, so let's think about this balloon game again. So if we were all sitting in a classroom and there's nine balloons in a collection of students, and then they, we let the balloons go apart just from three very, very simple rules. And these rules are similar to the actual universe. Um, so in this case, atoms, that would be the students, you all, can have zero or one unit of energy. You can have zero or one balloon. So this would be a binary universe, something like a, a lattice of hydrogen atoms. Uh, rule number two, energy, here, let me share my uh, slides again. Rule number two, energy moves by conduction. So you can't throw it in this simple universe. And so that would be something like, uh, um, I don't know, I guess heat in a metal. So energy only moves by conduction. You can only pass the balloons up, down, left or right. And then the third rule is energy is conserved. So that's the first law of thermodynamics. So there's no popping of the balloons and no 
magically producing balloons. And other than that, there are no other rules. And when I allow the, when I allow the um, game to play, we would watch the balloons spread out throughout the room. And I made a, a cheap version of that with just an Excel chart that I'll show you in a second. But we're scientists, and so we would measure something. Uh, the formal name for it is on fraction. And yeah, I even told myself, get rid of the overtly nerdy confusing notation. I wrote that last year and did not follow my own advice. Um, what this is saying, it's basically energy density. So it's, it's saying how much energy is in a given area. The symbol for density in physics is rho, and it can be mass density. That'd be like kilograms per, per cubic meter or um, you know pounds per foot or something. But in terms of energy, and we can put like an epsilon there for energy, it's joules per cubic meter. That would be volumetric energy density or for specific energy density, it'd be joules per kilogram. So when we're thinking about something like that, um, you know, I've, I've had friends brag that they're their diesel cars are so much more efficient because they get like 42 miles per gallon instead of 28 miles per gallon. It's not any more efficient. It has more energy per, per volume. The joules per gallon in diesel are bigger, are, is greater than the joules per gallon of unleaded. And that's just because it's a bigger carbon chain. Um, it's producing just the same amount of CO2 uh, equivalent per, per energy for the car. And so the energy density is measured all the time. Um, you think about it all the time in, in foods, right? Uh, the reason why you can eat celery all day and stay skinny is because the energy density of celery is super low, whereas the energy density of a Snicker bar is really, really high, the amount of energy per unit uh, gram or uh, space. Um, that's why if you're on a hike, you bring something like a cliff bar. You want something with a lot of energy density and not, not a lot of weight. And so we can measure the energy density of these balloons as they, they fly across the classroom. And that's all that this is saying. It's how much energy per, per number of atoms in a particular region. How much energy in region A per number of atoms in region A. But this might be a more useful way of, of thinking about it. Okay, I got to clear these annotations. We'll talk about this more later. Um, clear all drawings. See what's going on in the chat. Why do you have friends that brag about their diesel trucks? Uh, it's more, more people like last decade bragging about their diesel, their uh, TDI Volkswagens, um, you know, hippie kids down in Santa Cruz and Palo Alto and San Francisco. Um, but joke was on them. Turns out Volkswagen lied and their cars weren't nearly as good as they said they were. Um, all right. If you're, if you have nerdy friends, they brag about different things. All right. So this is my cheap Excel version of the balloons in the classroom. So here's region a, there's four units of energy for four students or four atoms in this region. And with those rules, things can only move up or down left or right with each pass with each turn and energy can neither be created nor destroyed and it can and other than that there's no other rules so just these simple rules and i allowed excel just to roll a random number generator to say whether any of these things would go up or down and so i didn't have a hand in this and this is this is the result after 12 iterations so after iteration one this first square it can't even go anywhere right it's not allowed to to move either um down or to the right. Um, but these three ones have a one, you know, one and a quarter chance to move in some direction. So after turn one, it goes like this. After turn two, like this. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. All right, so wasn't that exciting? but things slowly moved around following these very simple rules. And I didn't tell them to disperse. It just randomly dispersed because it was statistically more likely to go in one of these random directions than to all coalesce back into that corner. 
it would be very unlikely for it to all fall back to that corner. And if you blur your eyes a little bit, you can look at these squares of nine smaller squares, these bigger squares, if you, if you broke this into quadrants. And if you look at these nine, nine squares that represent four bigger squares, you can see that there's one unit of energy per nine squares. And so it, it spread out to be about one ninth the energy density, right? So one unit of energy per nine, nine atoms. And if you look at the entire square, you can do the math and six times six is 36. There's 36 squares and there's four units of energy. Four divided by 36 is one ninth. And so the average density became, stayed the same. There was four units of energy per 36 squares, but then when you start zooming in in locations, it turned into one unit of energy per nine squares. And so the average density spread out. So that's one in, in one observation. Energy tends to disperse and it spreads out evenly. And you can think about that too when you put um, cream and coffee or that, that match that I lit, that smoke just spread out everywhere. Or the, when you put cream and coffee, that chemical contrast, which is an energy gradient, it's an electrochemical energy gradient, that spreads out uniformly and evenly. Um, you, if you make a cup of coffee, it cools uniformly over the next half an hour. You don't have like one part of the coffee gets super cold and one part stay super hot. Energy tends to disperse and grows into this, you know, average density throughout, throughout uh, space. Um, and that's, that's what happened here with this stupid Excel spreadsheet. Uh, representing that energy just based on simple rules and that's how the universe works too there's just simple rules like can't go faster than the speed of light you can't teleport you can't do these different things and so that's 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 what happens so three general observations um, dropping pebble in a pond yeah in the absence of constraints energy tends to disperse So what is a constraint? Um, a constraint would be something like anything you're a, sounds like my daughter's having trouble. Um, a hydro flask or something like that, or a, a fancy cooler, that's a constraint. You're creating these insulating walls so the temperature can't spread out to the rest of the universe. Um, a more, Descriptive constraint that you use every day in your car would be a cylinder and a piston. Um, heat is quite a useless form of energy, but we can trick it into turning into more useful forms of energy like mechanical en energy to, to move uh, uh, a crankshaft and then eventually a wheel in a car. And the way you do that is you put all the heat in a cylinder and put a piston on top of it and the heat has only one way to go. It's highly constrained. It can't spread out evenly in all directions. It has to push that piston. And that way we trick that heat energy into doing something useful for us by designing, by engineering, very restrictive constraints on that, that system. But in the absence of constraints, energy just spreads out everywhere. And that's why electricity is so useful. It's really easy to constrain. If you have um, an electromotive force, a difference in electric potential, you know, one voltage versus another voltage, you can constrain it simply with a copper wire. And it, the electricity is not going to go anywhere else. It just goes through that copper wire. I mean, yes, we can talk about arcing and ridiculous things like that. But for the sake of this class, we're just talking about, you know, simple constraints for realistic voltages that you may find in your house. Second observation, the state of maximum dispersion or dispersal corresponds to equilibrium. So when things have spread out, then it's said to be in equilibrium. If we take a measurement of an intensive property, something that doesn't grow with mass or grow with um, energy, uh, something like density or temperature, it's uniform. Like we, we measure that temperature or density everywhere in the in the case of the last example, and we found it to be one ninth everywhere. Or if you measure the temperature inside of a cup of coffee, it's going to be uniform. So at the state of maximal dispersion, this is what we define as equilibrium. But there's one subtlety to 
to that. Um, if we watch those things move around, every once in a while, some, some would get kind of close together. And so the last subtle observation is that things aren't static at equilibrium. Equilibrium doesn't mean death. It doesn't mean nothing's happening anymore. It means that things are still moving about all over the place at a microscopic level, at a quantum level. And um, that can lead to very interesting things. And little pockets of the universe where you have things like a Zoom class and a coronavirus spreading across the globe. Like most of the universe is pretty boring, but every once in a while you find these little pockets where exciting things are happening. And this does not violate the second law of thermodynamics because although it's statistically incredibly un unlikely, it can happen. You can have a cat like appear in the universe somewhere. So that's the final thing. At equilibrium, the average value of an intensive parameter, the on fraction was uniform. So energy density was uniform, but fluctuations continued to occur. If you want to put things back together, if you want to fight the second law of thermodynamics, you need to consume a tremendous amount of energy to do so. You need to degrade an energy gradient. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is a tornado. You have hot land and a cold upper atmosphere, and that's a big energy gradient. That energy wants to disperse and, and equilibrate, but to do that, um, it can slowly diffuse and, and conduct, or you can create, due to complicated things like Coriolis effect, you can create a little uh, funnel that rapidly degrades that energy gradient. It moves the hot air from the land to the upper atmosphere very, very quickly. Same with like a hurricane that's headed towards Texas and Louisiana right now. Um, and by doing that, the energy gradient degrades very rapidly, but you create this beautiful symmetry and these complex structures um, that, that are only possible. They're highly ordered. They're anti-entropic in a way. They're, they're only possible because they're consuming so much energy around them. And the amount of energy that they consume is much greater than the amount of ener energy uh, that would be consumed otherwise. And if, if it just naturally diff diffused. But it doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics, creating that order because they create so much entropy around them. So you think about a tornado, it's creating absolute chaos, chaos around it. So the overall entropy in the universe continues to go, go up despite creating this you know, beautiful symmetrical structure. And the same thing can be said about life. Um, a tree, for example, has beautiful fractal symmetry, um, can, is highly ordered, has DNA, can reproduce, can do all these amazing things. But to do that, it has to consume a vast amount of energy via the sun, and it produces a lot of entropy around it, much more entropy than would otherwise be produced if it didn't exist. And you can extend that up to animal life and then human life. So our brains are incredibly complex structures, very anti-entropic, but they have to continually degrade energy. And I'm creating entropy all around me by running this brain. Um, you know, there's CO2 coming off of me, coming out of my house. Uh, there's trash in my alley. There's all sorts of things happening that are very entropic to produce something very ordered momentarily for, you know, a brief moment in time in the universe. And what's absolutely amazing is something like a society, you know, picture airplanes, look at like flight maps or, you know, a freeway in Seattle or San Francisco, um, these really incredible, incredible complex structures. I mean, the fact that we're all on Zoom right now, absolutely amazing levels of complexity. But to do that, we have to consume a tremendous amount of en energy and degrade it into waste heat everywhere, thus producing far, far, far more entropy than we would have had society not have existed. So the second law isn't violated, even though you can have these very localized, concentrated areas of order. I think that's absolutely beautiful. I think that's one of the most you know, amazing things in the universe. And a lot of physicists are really studying this. It's called maximum entropy production or minimum entropy potential. Uh, some people call it the fourth law of thermodynamics because there's something about the universe that not only is entropy produced, it has this arrow of time where as the universe progresses, it produces entropy more and more rapidly. Um, uh, structures become more sophisticated 
and more energy intensive and thus more produce more and more uh, uh, entropy over time. So you can, you can trace, you know, you know, the beginning of the universe to uh, star formation, to planet formation, to chemical formation, to uh, life formation, to societal formation, and the amount of entropy production per unit volume or mass increases over the course of the universe. Absolutely wild. This stuff is smarter than I am, but I find it fascinating. Um, really quick, yeah. Uh, yeah. the extroverted student that's supposed to say that stuff's going on in the chat. There's yeah. stuff going on in the chat. <laughs> There's a couple of questions in there. Oh yeah. Um, let's see here. So last question, their concern was everything in the universe eventually being stuffed out due to entropy. Yeah, read, read the Asimov, that short story I posted. Uh, but if they're able to travel near the speed of light or even potentially travel at the speed of light with huge amounts of matter in order to dilate the time and compression to the time passage of the rest of the universe, would thus method prolong the survival of the universe or would the energy used to move such a large amount of matter at such high velocity be more energy intensive than useful for adding under the time of the universe? I may have worded this weird, but I was curious about it. Okay, this is an incredible question. Um, as far as we know, the closer you get to the speed of light, yes, time goes to uh, go dilates to nothing. And so you can prolong things forever, but also the cost of energy goes to infinity. So it's two computing, it's, you know, taking um, zero divided by infinity. So good luck figuring that out. But yes, it's gonna, it's gonna get interesting. Um, super curious stuff. Uh, cute cat. Yeah, I noticed that cute cat too. Um, basically, things are spreading out, dispersing like balloons. Anti-entropic. Yeah, that's not really a word. It means um, things becoming more and more ordered. You can measure the the information content of something or the 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 limited amount of states something could possibly be in and still function. And the lower amount of possible states means the more ordered it is, the less entropic it is. So if you, you know, lined up four arrows all in the same direction, that'd be a highly ordered, you know, arrangement of those arrows versus, you know, any random 360 degree direction those arrows could face. Uh, is entropy a force or a thing? No, it sure seems like it, but it's, it's just a statistical probability. So like those squares that were spreading out on that simple Excel sheet, it just, it's statistically more likely to spread out because it has, it can go in four different directions than to just go to one quarter because then it could only go in like up or left directions till it found that, that corner again. It's just uh, an aspect of the rules of the universe and the statistical likelihood for something to happen. It's much more statistically likely for something to, to rust in the presence of oxygen than for the oxygen to jump off the iron and the iron to become more pure. But these, this minimum entropy potential and maximum entropy theory is quite interesting because although it's statistically highly unlikely, ordered things do happen at the cost of greater entropy elsewhere. But why does the universe like to arrange itself in ordered structures? I don't know. Um, okay. Is it a concept then or an observed reality? I don't know, we're getting into semantics. It's a physical property of the universe. It's something we can measure again and again, and the entropy of any open system uh, continues to grow. All right. So fluctuations and properties can and do occur at equilibrium. However, the size of most systems being macroscopic, like a cup of coffee, we don't notice. But if we had an infinitesimally small temperature probe, we'd see different variations in temperature. In fact, uh, let's look at that in the actual universe. Uh, so if I pull up share screen, this one. So if we look at the farthest reaches of the universe, um, 15 billion light years away, we can measure its temperature um, just with light. And it uh, turns out, uh, it's 2.7 degrees Kelvin. Uh, helium becomes liquid at 4 Kelvin, so cold as hell. But there's still variations happening because even at equilibrium at this 2.7 degrees Kelvin, things are still fluctuating at 0.0057 Kelvin variation. Why I remember this garbage, I don't know. 
but I do. Okay, so cosmic microwave background. And so we, yeah, we've imaged it and this is what it looks like. So grab something like this, uh, open image in new tab, um, switch tabs. Open image in new tab, this one. Yeah, so if we look at the, this is the entire sphere of the universe around us mapped onto this uh, oval. And we look in all directions, 15 billion light years away. That's as far as we can look. Uh, that's the age of the universe. Um, we see everything is 2.7 degrees Kelvin, but there's this fluctuation of 0 0.0057 Kelvin everywhere. Some places are a little hotter, some places are a little colder. And it's absolutely nuts. So this, this theory of dispersal of energy and fluctuations at equilibrium holds true to the farthest reaches of the universe. And it's just, that's, that's the universe. Do we know where the universe is expanding into? Um, now we're in deep questions here. <laughs> it's expanding into itself. There is nothing beyond the edge. It's just, that's it, but the it is growing. <laughs> it's making itself. Um, My brain's melting right now. Yeah. It, it gets a little tricky, I guess. <laughs> what is right. nothing? Let's get back to... Let's get back to society scale stuff. Um, stop, share this, share the PowerPoint. Uh, make this big again, okay. All right, good. Okay, so the second law of thermodynamics states that physical and chemical differences equilibrate over time. Energy gradients spread and dissipate irreversibly Useful energy is lost during energy conversions, and this precludes perpetual motion. Um, and so this is a bummer. You can't make things go on forever. And I like this illustration. Anybody know who this artist is? Escher. Yeah, MC Escher. Um, so you see this water let me turn this laser back on you see this water falling from a waterfall it spins this water mill and that water mill pushes water up this stream and then falls down again so if there were no energy losses this would happen but where where do you think energy is lost in this system you can either speak out or type in chat everywhere yeah, give me some examples of where it might be lost. Friction, yeah, so um, if you look at a creek or river, it moves most quickly in the center of the channel because it's not feeling the walls or the floor of the river. But along the sides here and along the floor, this water is going to be uh, colliding with the brick and scraping along it, slowing down. Um, corners, yep. Uh, Something about big brain stuff. <laughs> um, does this make any sound down here? Yeah. Yeah, so when it's falling, it's interacting with the air. It's causing eddies of air currents to spiral off this. Um, there's going to be all kinds of splashing and sound. These funky plants are going to be sprayed with water, as this guy is. Um, the water mill might be creaking and, and scraping against its... Uh, its bearings or axle there and so yeah energy is going to be lost all over this system and i mean i don't even yeah the water would fall here get pushed a teeny bit and then pool up and then go back here flood down here this guy would be in trouble in reality um my former job i was a postdoc for this global climate and energy project and we'd get uh, applications for different uh uh, novel energy technologies, you know, think of things like a solid oxide fuel cell or something, something that could burn natural gas at like 90% efficiency. Um, but every once in a while we get these crazy schemes like, oh, I'm going to use a solar panel to make hydrogen and then burn the hydrogen to run a turbine. And then that turbine, then I'll condense the water out of the turbine and then use a solar panel to get the hydrogen back out of the water. And 
that's basically a perpetual motion machine. So we just look at applications and it's, we'd count how many energy transfers or energy conversions there were. So in that case, we're going from like sun to chemo, chemo, electrochemical to chemical to heat to uh, mechanical to electrical. And you're just like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Every single one of those jumps is gonna lose energy along the way. And so overall, it's an idiotic idea. Um, we wouldn't write that when the proposal was denied, but uh, basically if you can count the number of energy conversions, the more you have, the, the less useful something's gonna be. So let's look at something that we use all over the place here in the, United, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, hydropower. So we take gravitational energy, um, the sun heats up water in the ocean, makes clouds, the rain rains on the mountains and puts water up high. And so we can take advantage of that potential energy, just like I lifted the bouncy ball up, the, the sun lifted water up for us. And then when the water runs downhill, it turns into kinetic energy, energy of motion. And so normally it runs down a river path, but we can siphon off a portion of it. This would be a so-called run of the river hydro system. It's much more friendly to fish and things like that because we're not creating a whole dam. And so we can, take a portion of that running water and as it falls that potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy energy of motion and then we can we can force that with a nozzle to spin a turbine and then that turbine can spin three magnets around to create an electrical current and that's what a generator is and then we can send that electricity somewhere um, but because of the second law of thermodynamics we can't take that electricity generated from that falling water and push that same amount of water back up hill. So more than one kilogram of water, that mass of water must flow downhill in order to convert enough energy to pump one kilogram back uphill. Because just like in that MC Escher painting drawing, there's energy lost all over the place. This penstock is going to have vibrations. So is the turbine. It's not going to be perfectly efficient. The generator is going to heat up with the electrical current running through the wiring. And all that energy came from somewhere. It came from that water falling down initially, but it's going to disperse uh, throughout, throughout this powerhouse and eventually throughout the, throughout the universe. And so um, energy is lost with any sort of, any sort of conversion that happens. You can't get it all. So there's this degradation of energy quality. We may have had one joule of potential energy, and then we had 0.9, 90% of that of kinetic energy. And then maybe 0.8 of that got turned into electrical energy. And so that residual, that 0.2, all just turned into low temperature waste heat that, that spread out everywhere. And this is actually a very efficient process. Uh, gravitational kinetic to uh, electricity is quite efficient. So there's this energy quality ladder um, and it all depends on how easily we can constrain this energy. So again, I said electricity, you can just constrain it in a wire. Um, kinetic mechanical energy, like this bike chain, it's very well constrained. It's just constrained to this chain here. Um, the, the cogs in this gear directly transfer mechanical energy to that chain. I guess, yeah, it's this way and puts tension on this chain. So there's nowhere for that energy to go. It pulls on this gear and then gets translated into your spinning bike tire. Um, there is friction and heat generated and that's why it's important to keep your um, chain oiled and you're trying to minimize that friction and heat to make your bike as efficient as possible. Next step down is chemical energy. So this is uh, energy contained in well-ordered low entropy chemical structures. That's what gasoline, coal, um, all sorts of chemicals are very ordered chemical structures. And we can trick them that's to generate things like electricity by creating um, a, a gradient in electrochemical energy. That's what a battery does. You have two cells that have different electrochemical potentials. And instead of allowing those two uh, chemicals to directly interact with each other, you create a membrane that only lets an ion pass through to create the chemical reaction. And then you force the electrons that are part of that chemical reaction around a current. And that's how a battery works. So you can get very high efficient chemical uh, conversions up to like 90% with lithium ion batteries uh, through, through chemistry. 
You can also choose to just light the thing on fire and combine it with oxygen. That's, that's very efficient because you're going from chemi chemistry to high temperature. It's not very efficient trying to go from chemistry back to electricity that way, but lighting something like coal on fire is about 100% efficient uh, for making high temp. And then with high temperature energy, you can still do things like constrain it in a piston and make a car move or force it through a turbine and make blades spin. Um, but as soon as you get down to like low temperature energy, you can't do much with that. Uh, you can warm yourself a little bit, but that energy is just going to disperse. It's just going to spread out via infrared radiation everywhere. Um, a flippant way to describe this is, you know, I can run the computer. I have, with electricity, but if I pour this cup of espresso on my computer, there's energy in this, um, in in the temperature, not the espresso. Espresso is just a, a, a nootropic trick to make me feel more energetic, but it actually has no energy. It's gonna wear me out in about two hours. Cam comes with a cost. But um, if I pour this on my computer, it has energy in it, but it's not gonna help my computer run because it's very, entropic, very poorly ordered energy, and my computer wants electricity, so it can actually arrange the electrons to do mathematical computations. I can't do math with, with low temperature energy. So when you're going down the ladder, things are very efficient. You can go to electricity to low temp, 100% efficiency, but going up the ladder, it's very inefficient. Um, we'll look at that in a second. Okay, we'll, we'll We'll run into Friday with this lecture, but because I want to take some of this a lot more slowly. Um, so here is, this is a gas fired boiler or coal fired. This is a coal fired power plant. Um, you burn fuel or coal here and you heat up water, make steam, that, run that steam through a turbine and it spins a generator to make electricity. So what are the energy inputs? to this system? Um, fuel and air, and then I see cold water as an input. Yep. Yeah, I think you got them all. So yeah, you need that cold water to condense the steam to allow it to be pumped back into the boiler. Another way of phrasing that is you need to get rid of the entropy. Um, that steam has a lot of entropy. It's moving all over the place. It's not well ordered. And you got to dump that entropy into the lake and then cool it down and allow ordered water to return to the boiler. Um, yeah, people forget that. Even smart places. Um, Stanford was redesigning their, their uh, gas fired power plant, and their professor's very upset with how much water it consumed. And uh, like another professor was like, how do you, you have to get rid of the entropy? <laughs> like you can't just burn natural gas. You have to make steam. The entropy has got to go somewhere and that entropy goes up into the atmosphere. Um, if you try to capture that steam, then you take as just as much energy condensing that steam back down via the refrigerator to save the water. Um, maybe I'm getting too out into the weeds here. So yeah, the energy inputs, fuel, air, and water, and the, energy outputs what we want, electricity, but there's also some water out, some hot water, that was an energy output right here, and combustion gases. So all the smoke that went up the, uh, the smokestack here. So here's this, this is the third equation I want you to know. Remember, power equals energy over time, heat capacity, change in temperature depends on the mass, heat capacity, and change in temperature of something. And then this, this third equation is efficiency. So this Greek symbol eta, and it says useful in outputs. So this would be electricity. That's the only thing we care about. We don't care about smoke coming out the, the, the coal power plant. I mean, we do, but not in terms of useful output. That's a useless output. And then uh, the energy inputs. And we really only are concerned with what society pays for, so the, the fuel here. So we can look at the efficiency of these different power plants and think about, think about that. Again, I like to think of it as what you get for the useful output over what you pay. Um, 
And we'll talk a lot more about this this Friday and I'll have a bunch more examples. So let's look at some efficiencies really quick in the last three minutes or so. Um, remember that energy ladder going from electricity to mechanical to chemical to high temperature to low temperature. And so if we're going, here we're going up the ladder from mechanical to elect electrical. And this is actually quite efficient, 70 to 99%. Um, electric motor, that's electrical to mechanical, that's 50 to 90%. Gas furnace, this is your lighting natural gas on fire to make heat, that's 70 to 95%. Um, the gas has a lot of hydrogen in it. It's four parts hydrogen, one part carbon. And when you burn hydrogen in oxygen, you get H2O, you get water. And that water condenses and steals some of the, uh, some of the energy from you um, due to the latent heat of condensation going from steam to water, it sucks a little energy out. Uh, wind turbines, mechanical to electrical, these are quite efficient. The more blades you have, the more efficient they get, but they also the more costly they get. And that's why you end up with three blades on all the wind turbines, because that is the peak of efficiency versus cost. You can put a lot more blades on it. You can look at like old wind mills, not wind turbines in England or France or something that, that, that made grain. Uh, and they, you know, have, I guess in Holland, where they all are, you'd have, you know, a hundred blades or something. It makes it more efficient, but a lot more expensive. Fossil fuel power plant. So here you're burning something like coal that makes high temperature heat that goes to mechanical to spin a turbine and then electrical to spin a generator. So here you have one, two, three energy conversions. You're going to lose energy at each stage due to entropy. It's going to go up, mainly go up to smokestack. So these are only 30 to 40% efficient. Nuclear power plants, same thing, except the uh, heat comes from atoms splitting and they actually have slightly lower efficiencies, um, not because of anybody's fault except for safety, right? So we don't run these quite as hot as coal power plants because when one of these things goes wrong, you know, just watch Chernobyl, it's not, it's not good. That's an amazing, that's like the best horror TV show I've seen in a long time. Um, automobile engine, chemical, gasoline, to thermal, high temperature, to mechanical. Uh, typical car is about 22% efficient. So an electric car, that's up here, electric to mechanical. So it it's, can push up to like 90% efficient. So this is why electric cars are um, three to four times more efficient than, than gas powered cars. And so even though your electricity is, a little, is more expensive per unit energy than gasoline, you're going to save a lot of money by about a factor of three with an electric car because uh, all that energy actually goes into something useful rather than smoke out your tailpipe. Um, okay, what else we got? Fluorescent lamp, whatever, incandescent lamp, nobody has these anymore. LED lamps are pushing like 50% efficiency. Solar cells, um, if you buy one from like uh, Western Solar Ecotech here in town, it's going to be about 18% efficient. Um, then fuel cell, so this is kind of like a battery. You're tricking the, the chemistry rather than burning it, you're, you're tricking the electrons uh, to go through a current. Um, one minute left. I just want to, this is, this is a, I love this chart. Uh, stare at it in your own time. If you got to go, go. But I want to talk about this really quickly. Um, this is from this old book in the 70s called like, man energy and society you know before 1980 women didn't exist so it's only men back then and that's why it's called that i suppose um but oh yeah what's in the, look up rtgs yeah that's right here that's uh thermal to electrical so rtg is a radio radio thermal generator um if you've seen the martian uh matt damon has like a rover and uh he's driving around Mars in it, it's run off of a chunk of plutonium and it takes the casing off of it, or at least the, the insula insulating shield uh, so that it gives him warmth too. And so in that case, seven, eight percent of that energy from uh, the plutonium, uh, the fissile plutonium goes into electricity and the rest of it just goes into waste heat. How does a RTG work? You have two different metals that have 
different conductivities based on temperature, something like copper and iron or copper and tin, and you put them next to each other and you heat it up, the same temperature will cause a different conductivity and cause electrons to flow from one metal to another. You put something in between that, like a battery or an in, a motor, and you can make that motor, battery, or light bulb work. Terribly inefficient, but if you have something like plutonium that's going to keep on uh, popping off for a couple million years, and it's it's a fine way to go. Um, incidentally, the Mars, the real Mars rovers were supposed to last like 90 days based on their solar panels and batteries, but they ended up going like 10 years. And people were like, that's impossible what happened. And uh, NASA said, well, actually, we put some plutonium on there. And they weren't allowed to do that because you don't, you're not supposed to launch plutonium from Earth because if the rocket explodes like Challenger or something, then you have a dirty bomb falling over Florida. But um, for the sake of science, they just kind of kept their mouth shut and worked out great this time. Um, yeah, so yeah, RTG is this one. Terribly inefficient, but pretty cool. Uh, let's look at thermal to mechanical. Thermal to electrical, that's what, uh, this is what our, that's the RTG. Chemical to electrical, these are things like batteries. So the best batteries are lithium ion batteries. And so they're pushing 90% now. Um, this again was made in the 70s, so it's a little dated. Um, chemical to thermal, this is what boilers are. So your home furnace, 65% if you're burning oil. If you're burning gas, it's like 85%. If you have a condensing boiler, then you're gonna be up at 95%. Um, all sorts of things to talk about, but I'm going way over. Any questions before I let you guys go? So are energy conversions done the ladder, like kinetic to chem, always efficient, down the ladder, like kinetic to chem, always efficient, and the other way is inefficient, like high temp to kinetic, yes. Yeah, if you're going down the ladder, it's gonna be really efficient. If you're going up the ladder, it's not as efficient. Because it's, what's the ladder actually describing? It's your ability to constrain the energy. And so in the absence of constraints, energy tends to disperse. With constraints, you can direct that energy. You can trick it to do something useful for you. And it's really hard to constrain low temperature electric, low temperature uh, material, air, and it's really easy to constrain something like electricity or mechanical. Can you go back to the slide with the four laws and the balloon example? What are the three fundamental equations again? Um, I'll go back to the four rules for the simple example. Um, and then I'll, I'll do the three equations that you should know on this page. Um, power equals energy over time. These can have different units, you know kilowatt hours, et cetera. But this is just one example. So I guess, yeah, in kilowatt would be energy over time. So this all balances out. The other equation you're supposed to know is the heat capacity equation. So if you want to change the temperature of a material, you have to put energy into it. If you want to change the temperature of your house or the water for your shower, you need to put energy in it. How much energy depends on how much water, the mass, the heat capacity of the water, so the propensity of the water or any other material to change temperature with a given energy input, and the, uh, the amount of temperature you want to change. So if you have twice as much stuff, it's going to take twice as much energy. If you have twice as much temperature change, it's going to take twice as much energy. And then the final equation is efficiency, and that's... Um, what you get over what you pay. Um, let me think of an example for efficiency. So if I heated my house with a baseboard heater, 100% efficient. Um, but if we think about where that electricity came from, if it came from a power plant, for example, say the natural gas power plant downtown uh, by uh, Glass Beach, forget the actual name of that beach, everybody just calls it Glass Beach because it's gnarly, then you, the total system efficiency would equal the power plant times the efficiency of my heater. And so this would equal 
0 0.4, because that power plant's about 40% efficient times one, because my heater's 100% efficient. So the total efficiency would be 40%, not 100%, as I ignorantly thought when I just plugged my heater in. And that's why combining this with a heat pump, which can be 400% efficient because it's not generating heat, it's just moving heat, then you get this efficiency of 1.6 or 160%. That's why it's way better to use a heat pump than, than a baseboard heater. Um, yeah, so we'll talk more about this stuff on Friday. We're just gonna be talking about energy quality. Otherwise, if you want to set up office hours or something like that, just send me an email. We can talk. Good questions today. When are we going over the next homework? That'd be Monday. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Bye.